that video so you make sure you can press pause straight away. So bear with me. Do, do, do. Right, we are live, so you should see that now, Steve. We are live. Uh, okay. Right, uh, so we are live. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce our next guest uh, for the live Q&A. It's with Steve Murray, and we had him on, I think... It was August uh, last year and Steve flew the uh, Hawker Hunter and Mirage 3. But Steve, uh, what have you been up to since we last chatted? Well, I was hoping, um, I think we spoke when I was doing the interview, was that I was possibly going to go across and fly the Hunter that they've got ready in, um, in West Sale in Victoria. Um, and it turns out I was supposed to be the backup in case the chap who came from the UK and was going to fly that in case he couldn't get his license. As it turned out, he did get his local license. And so uh, my backup status <laughs> fell away. So I'm back here in in, in um, Perth and um, just enjoying some autumn weather at this stage, right? And also nice. playing, playing lots of VR stuff with my instructor, my 14-year-old instructor. <laughs> Very nice. So, guys, get your questions coming in uh, for Steve. But, Steve, can you maybe just give us a one-minute, two-minute, just a brief background so if, if people haven't heard of you or watched the interview of your flying career? Sure. Um, I started, well, first of all, I wanted to become a pilot from very young, living on a farm and having jets flying over the top of us. And um, eventually joined the Air Force as a, an instrument technician. I didn't actually have the qualifications to join as a pilot. Uh, after four years, I managed to get onto the pilot's course. I did my basic training on the Provost, uh, Piston Provost, and then onto the Hunters, um, sorry, on the Vampire for our advanced flying, and also for the OCU, the weapons um, conversion, and then onto the Hunter. On the Hunter for 18 months, and then went on to the Mirage in South Africa on secondment for three years, and then back into Rhodesia flying helicopters. Um, and then I instructed on basic uh, instruction on a, a Janet, uh, we call it the Janet, the SF, S, CM McKinney SF-260. And then back with the helicopters instructor and I finished up in the Air Force flying the Hunter as a B flight commander and instructor um, on one squadron uh, in Rhodesia, of course. And um, at that stage it was uh, Zimbabwe, Air Force of Zimbabwe. I also was doing the helicopter flying for the sort of rescue and also still instructing part-time on this SF-260. So it was a great way to lead the Air Force. And from then into airline flying. Um, flew for Air Zimbabwe, flying the 70, uh, Viscount 707 and 720, and then to Cathay for three years, flying the Boeing 747 and the TriStar. And then managed to get down to Australia where I was aiming to arrive, um, wanting to immigrate to, and I got to fly the Airbus A300 as the first officer, and then did my command training on the 737 and eventually flew um, the 300, the 400, and the, finished up on the 800, check and training captain on the 737-800 when I retired. That's it in a nutshell, right? Well, I mean, what a great career. So, yeah, guys who are just joining us for this live Q&A, get your questions coming in. But there's a few there on the side, Steve, so I'm going to let you loose and enjoy, folks. Sure, Mike. We'll go from here. So I'll just... Clicking on Panzer ZA Jr. And nothing's happening. Yeah, ah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Have you tried that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he's asking you, did you ever use guns on the oh, Mirage 3? Am I, so I don't speak to this guy directly. I'm just answering his question. Okay. It's Panzer ZA Jr. And the question was, did you ever use guns on the Mirage 3? If yes, how hard to get the shots on target? Yeah, we had um, guns for air to ground, uh, which is what we were used primarily for in, 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 South, in Southern Africa situation. And um, yes, the Mirage 3 was actually an air-to-air -air aircraft. Therefore, um, any time we used it for guns, it was basically a, uh, just a, a pipper. Like the old basic, probably on a, 
uh, Fokker D7 or that sort of thing. There was no computing at all for wind or anything like that. So that was really difficult to get shots on targets, uh, especially if there was a wind blowing. When we came to do air-to-air -air gunnery, uh, practice gunnery, that was down in Cape Town, then we got to lock on and then the, the, the target was a lot easier um, to acquire and to maintain. But certainly, on the, a good question there, because on the air to ground, it wasn't easy. I'd come off the Hunter, uh, where we had a computing site for air to ground, and that was a lot better. But of course, that was because the design was for air to ground. Um, Panzer ZA, for the second period, Panzer ZA Jr., for the second question, how good did your eyesight have to be to join the Air Force? At that stage, um, it had to be um, 6 6 or 20 20, whatever, whichever they want to use the designation. And um, and that up until about fairly recent times, whereas now joining the Air Force, I know in Australia, yeah, you can actually join with glasses. So that was a big change for us. It had to be a very good eyesight. And um, continuing with Panzer ZA Jr., will you ever write a book about your service in the Indonesian Air Force and SAP? In fact, um, in my interview, uh, Mike was kindly enough to um, advertise my uh, book about the air flying in the Rhodesian Air Force. It's called The Joy of Flying. And um, it's, was, it was published in South Africa, but available on Amazon. And it's, I had to buy a couple of my own. So what I had to do was on Amazon, The Joy of Flying, Steve Murray, and uh, it came up and you can order the book as a hardcover, softcover, or Kindle. Um, a matter of interest there is that I, I never intended publishing a, an autobiography of any sort or flying, but um, the request came in from the South African Air Force Facebook page. Um, I, I put a, during COVID, I put a story on there um, about um, doing a beat up of my dad on a farm in Rhodesia and it, what did they say it went viral so and after that um, they kept asking me for more stories and eventually ended up with about 60 and those are all in the book it's basically they looked about uh, there's a bit about combat um, but mainly about just the pure joy of flying both the hunter and the mirage and also some of the civil flying as well the airline flying which I also really much enjoy um, so that's the book. Um, also from Panzer ZA. How good would you say uh, were both Air Forces and what were some of the flaws in them? Actually, surprisingly, um, both Air Forces were extremely good. First of all, in Rhodesia, um, we were fighting a war for our country as a resource. And so, therefore, and we had minimum aircraft, like when I was flying the Hunter, we only had 11 of them. We probably only had 11 vampires. Choppers, we had a lot. And that was our, the bulk of our, our, our warfare was flying um, with choppers and troops and with the gunships. All Alouette threes, basically. And um, the Reed Air Force operated very well. And I think that's historical. Now, you can look up anything on YouTube and find out about the Reed Air Force and how, how well it operated. Um, a lot of the positives about the Air Force, and I've mentioned this before, is that we didn't have a great, a great gradient between the, um, the, the, the ranks. So, for example, on helicopters, we often spend a lot of our time helping our technicians to clean them, to service them. I know I got fairly proficient on servicing the 303 um, um, machine guns we had on the side of the troopers. And so that, that, that made a difference to our whole approach to the, uh, the Air Force itself. Flaws, um, I think for, for us, if, if it can be called a flaw, was the fact we had less, we had so little in the way of being able to buy a new aircraft. So we were just using the ones we had and just maintaining them. For the South Southern Air Force, um, they were also a very efficient Air Force. And it was proved to me uh, when we were flying the Mirage that we had Israelis come and fly with us. And um, that was just after the Yom Kippur War, which is the second war they were, well, they've always been highly successful in all their wars in the air, in the air to air. And when they flew with the South African pilots, and also one of our Indonesian pilots, the inner Mirage 3, um, the South African pilots acquitted themselves very well. And from any flaws, I just remember that um, they had problems recruiting, getting recruits for the, the ground crew. So a lot of the ground crew they used when I was on the squadron 
were actually um, call up guys, the territorials, um, and the, who did their, their, their annual service. And so that it probably meant that they had more guys, um, inexperienced guys working on the aircraft. But um, by the by, that was if that, that can be called a flaw. As I went into the to the Angola part of the war, probably became I wasn't there then, but they probably became far more efficient. And did you ever fly? This is also Panzer ZA Junior. Did you ever fly combat missions for the Rhodesian Air Force or the SAF? Um, for the Reserve Air Force, I was there purely during peacetime. And even if there was any sort of combat, we wouldn't have been involved because we were there under a diplomatic status. Um, and if you watch my interview, I talk about why we were flying the Mirage in South Africa. Basically, we were hoping to get the Mirage 3C back to Rhodesia, which never happened. But um, and the helicopters, I flew combat in, uh, in fact, and the hunters as well. well I, before I went to fly the Mirages, we did a couple of strikes on the hunters, um, air to ground strikes, and uh, one large one. And then when I went back to flying helicopters, I was probably in combat for about 18 months um, on helicopters in between instruction. And um, yeah, there was a fair bit of combat involved there. And um, we have another question here from Biggles Tintin. Uh, did you ever get bored with flying long cap missions? And if you did, what did you do to leave the boredom? That was never a problem with us. Um, the, we actually only flew in the Hunter. Um, our maximum uh, time in the air was um, an hour of maximum. The mirror was sometimes less if we were practicing air combat. And um, we didn't have the same sort of problems that you they talk about with caps in, in Europe and perhaps in Vietnam and um, Afghanistan. So that never was ever a problem. We were up into, the, into whatever we were going to do and then back home again. So that was never a problem for us um, doing CAP missions. Um, back to Panzer Zero Jr. Did the Relief Air Force train a lot of air-to-air -air combat when you were flying with the SAV? Uh, sorry, when you were flying with the SAV, did you do any combat training? And if you did, what did you think of the capabilities and the flying? Well, um, that was a, in the Rhodesian Air Force, it was, we did basic um, camera quarter attacks and that type of thing because our primary role was air to ground and we never had um, an air to air threat at all. When we got down to South Africa, when I was flying the Mirage, um, this, it was a role, even though there wasn't a threat at the time. Air combat um, was was one of our, our tasks, and uh, that's when I first started the air combat training. And um, it was turned out to be the, the, the aspect I enjoy, enjoyed most about my in my aviation flying for the pure flying point of view. And um, to this day, I'm still doing it on virtual reality. And at this stage, we, uh, in the initial stages of doing um, anyway gunnery dogfighting, which I did on the Mirage and the Hunter, but hoping to, with my wingman here, hoping to improve and do a bit more uh, of the uh, missile training. But going back to the SAF, um, I did my training obviously on the Mirage 3C, and we had the Mirage 3C and the Mirage uh, 3E. Um, and they were sort of dissimilar combat because the Mirage 3C, um, head was lighter, even though its engine wasn't as powerful as the 3E, but in combat it actually outperformed the 3E, and so we actually were able to do some sort of um, dissimilar combat, and the air combat came up in camps, so we would do, um, we'd probably disperse to different parts of the country to do air to ground, um, to do air to air, and to do supersonic air, air, um, air to air. And then we would come back, and at base we generally did our air-to-air air air dogfighting, air combat training, and it was a camp for a couple of weeks. And then if we went, we couldn't go supersonic over land below 30,000 feet, so we used to go down to Durban, and we would do our air-to-air air combat training there, and we were had the ability to go supersonic, which we did. It was never a supersonic fight, but we might have to go supersonic in, in the bottom of, 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 a, of a maneuver. So that was, we, we could take that down to five, our hard deck was 5,000 feet. Um, but once again, and uh, the capabilities of the aircraft, the Mirage, 
and was never designed, the Delta was never designed as a as an air to air aircraft, um, air combat aircraft, and it was purely as an interceptor and to climb up, the French were designed to climb up um, very rapidly to whatever height the bear bomber was coming from Russia, accelerate to whatever speed it wanted, using a rocket pack if required, shoot down the bear bomber and then be talked down to landing, and there was this total roll, and and, it, it proved, and the cockpit had showed it because it had a very basic navigation, very basic fuel system. It carried a couple of um, sidewinders, um, 30 millimeter cannon, and we had a, a, a radar guided missile as well, one of the early ones that the French produced. Um, but that was about it. And um, but when it came to doing air combat with the the Delta. If you want to do generate an overshoot, it worked extremely well, um, and um, because of the, the the high drag, as long as you didn't bring the speed back too much, it actually was it turned out to be a really good uh, combat aircraft, as the Israelis proved. Um, and yeah, um, we, we really enjoyed. Look out, not up with a par with a later aircraft, because you couldn't see beyond about um, uh, two, four o'clock. Uh, or eight o'clock behind you, but um, still, it was good. For, we enjoyed our air combat in the Mirage. The Hunter, when I went back to a region just before I finished the Rhodesian Air Force, um, or well, there was Air Force in Zimbabwe at the stage, I was, we were now having come from South Africa and having trained in air to air combat, um, we found the Hunter was very maneuverable and very good for air combat, um, tra uh, training and flying. And, um, yeah, so once again, I've talked a lot about that here because it's still a passion of mine to read about it, to read about the ACEs and also fly it in my virtual reality. Um, right, we've still coming down now to Panzer A again. What were a few things you liked or disliked about the Hunter and the Mirage? Okay, there's not a lot to talk about the dislikes, but uh, certainly the Hunter, um, it was uh, both a beautiful looking aircraft. Um, the Hunter controls were very light and very um, comfortable to, they, to fly the aircraft. It had a great acceleration as well um, for an aircraft at that time. I came off the Vampire onto the Hunter and it was a light year jump uh, in, in performance. Um, um, as far as uh, the, the, just the negative side, I just found that the cockpit ergonomics were a nightmare, um, uh, which was, uh, everyone's talked about it. Um, from the Mirage aspect, um, once again, a lovely aircraft to fly, a lot more um, heavy on the controls, and that was um, power controls, of course, but that was, I think, to avoid breaking the aeroplane. It had such a high rate of roll that you had to uh, pull it fairly harshly. Um, well, I would say, sure, I say, it was just, it was just heavy on the controls so that you couldn't over-control it. Um, but once again, there's huge controls, both for the, not so much for the Hunter, but for the Mirage. So it would be easy to really over, over control it if the controls hadn't been that heavy. But um, that was good and a bad thing. Um, but for the Mirage again, just from the pure the way we operated it, it was it was very basic, probably too basic. In the CZ that I flew, the EZ they upgraded the navigation with TACAM and uh, Doppler and uh, became a bit more fuel. And um, so that was more for the ground attack role. But for us, the disadvantage in a ground attack role was the, 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 the basics of the fuel system and the navigation. And as I mentioned earlier, the gun sight for any ground, because it was just a ring and beat sight, basically. Um, the next one is this Ralph Davy. I've got Ralph Davy here. Nice pick of the Mirage 3EZ. Shows scheme nicely. What, was always discussion on how effective the buck color was compared to the dark color Earth of the Impala. Actually, I've seen a video, I'm going to a photograph here. It, the, the, the color worked out really well because when I went down to the Mirage, I was flying the, the CZ at that stage, and um, the aircraft that I went solo in, if you I talk about my book, The Joy of Flying, um, the aircraft I'm climbing out there from my solo, was actually green and gray. So they tried a fair, fair number of um, color schemes um, with the Mirage. And that's one that came up at that stage. I don't know what they did eventually, but I know certainly with the, the, the CZ, the EZ, and the F1, 
and all the, the Jews all had that, that, that buff color scheme. And I've got, uh, you're flying over parts of um, the Eastern Transvaal there, the, um, the West, Northwestern Transvaal. I think it worked very well, actually. Um, once again, the other thing was that the Buccaneers, for example, they didn't, they still had the blue color uh, from the Royal Air Force or the Royal Navy sort of color scheme, but that was for operating on the sea house stream. Anyway, yeah, I thought it worked out. I thought it was a good color scheme for the Mirage. Well, I think it looked spectacular as well because it was un unusual in any of the other kind of camera classes will ride. Um, I've got Ian Saxon. Um, hi there, Mike and Steve. That's about all he said. Um, uh, there we go, the next one. British Cats 1. Okay. I'm a new pilot. Any advice for new pilots and pilots trying to join the Air Force? Okay. Now, um, certainly, joining the Air Force, it's, um, it's a dedication. And I've said a lot of, I've mentored a lot of young guys. In fact, with Jordan here, who's been helping me on the BR, um, it, it's, it's going to require a lot of work. You, it's, it's, it's a dedication um, in that you've got to do well at school, which uh, I was fortunate. I was, even though I didn't do all that well at school, I was still managed as a pilot. But that, was once again another part of my dedication was once I got in the Air Force, I kept on beating the door down until they let me fly. But try not, it, the idea is to try and get the best education you can at school. And in different Air Forces, they require you then to go to university, which in case you need a decent education. In our particular case, we could join, join directly um, into the Air Force. I know the Australians can as well, they either go to university or go directly. But once again, education is very important to get in and have a decent education. Then um, once you're in the Air Force, it's not all over at that stage because um, they're going to try every which way to um, not break is the wrong word, but um, the exercise, the testing, and um, from the medical point of view, from the ability point of view. I have to say that when I went back to instruct, I was amazed and how quickly the guys had to learn. So everyone joining the Air Force is capable of being a pilot um, because they put you through that process, through um, initiation process um, or interview process and all sorts of um, physical things that you do before you join the Air Force. But once you're in, and it's not all over, I say again, because you have to learn at a high rate. And in our Air Force, it was up to 30% failure rate. That was about average failure rate. And not particularly because of inability to fly, it's inability to, to learn at, at a high rate. So once again, a dedication to get through that. So, and then in this Air Force, like coming into uh, listening to Australians here, once they're through the Air Force and they've done their, um, they, they, they've got their wings, they then, if they want to be fighter pilots, they then go to the, F, uh, to the fighter training school, which I'm sure is based in, around the Air Force, around the world, it's probably the same. You then, are not guaranteed to go and fly your top jet, uh, your, your top fighter. You still have to pass another course. So all along the way, it's it's hard work, um, but it's the rewards are far outweigh the, the, the work that you've had to go through. Once you get to fly these uh, high performance aircraft, absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. And uh, it's something you, you, and if you get to that stage, please. Please remember how much you're enjoying it. I remember flying with a guy in Qantas once, and we were talking about flying jets and um, the, what we did in the Air Force. And I've obviously talked about my Hunter Mirage, and he was an F-18 pilot. And after we, towards the end of our, our trip, because you, you didn't fly the same guy often at all, but he said to me, you know, I, I'm really sad now just having that chatting with you that I didn't realize how much fun I was having at that time. So when you get to fly these aircraft, it might not be for too long, but enjoy it. Enjoy the, enjoy the, and then the hard work will show. Anyway, that was a long explanation, but I feel very, very strongly about that. It's a dedication required, and you've got to work hard to get there. Once you get there, the rewards are more than satisfactory. Christy is the next one. How happy are you, Steve, to see that the whole country still service over 70 years? Amazing, Christy. And that's, it's, Fantastic. In fact, uh, because of the, my sort of experience and, and um, being around this aircraft for so long, I've been contacted by various people who have started the Hunter. The latest was the, 
a test flying school in Canada. They've acquired a Hunter two-seater, T7, and the, the test pilots um, who were going to be instructor test pilots have never flown a Hunter. So I was I had an interview about um, three weeks ago, and even though I've never flown the T7, I only flew the big engine Hunters. Um, it was just I was I was able to impart the knowledge because the flying the aircrafts are very similar, the, the characteristics, the um, the mechanics of it are very similar to the to the aircraft that I flew. And it was just nice to see there's another hunter going to be flying. And it'll be, there'll be some in Australia. The sad thing, that, of course, is that there are no civil hunters flying in England, in the UK. I went to, I launched one of my children's books in Campbell in, in 2001, in the 50th anniversary of the hunter, first flight of the hunter with Neville Duke. And uh, the, the, the whole show ended with 13, was it 13 or 15 hunters and private hunters? Civil hunters flying in formation overhead. Man, that brought the tear to the eye. And uh, and I know we don't see that in the UK again. It, it, it's, it's so sad. Um, I just hope that is reversed at some stage through that, that, that crash there. Anyway, it's amazing to see it flying again. And and I'm not sure if you know, but they actually use um, that naughty aviation in Canada that, that um, leases the aircraft down to the United States Air Force they're actually rebuilding engines now, and they're probably going to be doing all, all the spares because it's still going to be fine. You know, it's it's. Um, you look at the B-52, they're re-engineering them now, and the, the Hunter's probably an equally uh, um, capable uh, machine as the B-52 as far as its strength and everything like that goes. And if they keep on manufacturing spares, goodness knows how long they'll keep on flying the Hunter. You know, it's obviously the fact that... Um, that if an attack in the United States has gone through some other jet fighters like the, what they have, the Draken, um, and I think they might have had a couple of others, but they've stuck with the Hunter. Amazing aeroplane. Yeah, Christy, it's amazing. I've got David Smith now as the next one. The Mirage is as famous as a one circle fighter. Was a one circle, uh, was a Hawk a one circle or two circle fighter, which is a more fun to dogfight with. Now, um, you say the hunters, the mirror, the, the hawk is an uh, is a comparable power um, to weight as the um, the. Hang on, I'm thinking about the hunter. Okay, the mirror is the one who with the hawk would be both. It could be both. The the mirage that I was talking about the mirage earlier, and um, it was it was never designed as a, as a dog fighter, but in fact it operated very well as such. The hawk is more is it comparable to the hunter as a as a as a dog fighter, and it would be one circle or two circle, I'm, I'm sure. And um, I would say the hunter. Um, I would say probably Mirage would be the more um, fun to fly because of the afterburner. The, the, you, you're limited with power with with the hunter, um, and with the Mirage, having the capability of with the afterburner, although they reduce the time of in the air. Having the, the hunt, the, having the afterburner and the mirage uh, provided more fun. I would think that's the right word. Yeah, it was great, great to fly um, in, do, in ACM. Um, British, uh, British Jets one is, um, we're just going to move it. Uh, there we go. Um, what would you say is the most important aspect in attempting to become a fighter pilot? Okay, um, first we're going back to the, the, the earlier question about joining the Air Force. Um, I would say 95%, and I, I may be wrong, but this is my experience, certainly for me, uh, was to join the Air Force to fly, not to go and be military or start um, you know, going to war or anything like that. It was purely to fly a high, a high performance jet fighter. And thankfully, we had the Hunter, which was to me, was that was was state of the art at the time when I flew, and so was the Mirage. Um, these days, you've got so much more, but you've actually once again got to do the hard work um, because when you graduate from the uh, from when you get your wings and after you learn your weapons conversion, most Air Force will graduate um, you fighter pilot, bomber pilot, transport pilot, helicopter pilot. So, going back to your question now. Um, You've got to work hard. You've got to produce the goods so that you end up in that top 
probably five ten percent of the of the of a passing out parade, and that's what gets you to the to the to the fast jet. And then once again, the work starts again because you're probably going to go to some sort of fast jet training squadron. And once again, it's hard work to, to get yourself through. But the rewards are there. You fly in these days. You're going to be flying an A35, um, F35, if in, in in most parts of the world now, and that's going to be an amazing aircraft to fly. I think. Um, They've actually knocked it around a little bit because they say it can't do a, it can't do its dog fighting as well as an F-16 or um, a comparable aircraft. Of course, I, it, my own belief there is that the aircraft is unlikely it's ever going to dog fight um, with the capability of its missiles and its radar um, attack system. However, it will always be dog fighting involved, and I'm sure it still puts up a good fight. It's got a great lookout. So once again, yeah, you know, you've got to work hard, get to the top of your course, and then you'll go to your fighter pilot. So in answer to the question, what is the most important aspect of attempting to become a fighter pilot? Work hard and just aim high. Um, will Apodoka, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got that correction. Um, yeah, yeah. Correct. Were you involved in Cap Operation Gatling? No. Um, at that stage, I was on instruction. Um, just for those who want to know, an operation Gatling was one of the external operations um, that occurred in in the Rhodesian Bush War. Um, I think in that particular one, I, was, I wasn't around at the time, but it was mainly a, a ground-based um, operation. Um, I was involved in a couple, one of the, the, the big ones, which was quite interesting, actually. Recently, I, I didn't realize, we had one called Op Dingo, which was involved, the whole Air Force virtually. We had something like 40 helicopters, all the hunters, all the cameras, all the vampires, and uh, the, the the results were so impressive. And with, with, with helicopter-borne troops, but being the RLI and the SAS, it's now used in some special forces um, scenarios for staff colleges as to how successful that operation was. Um, and, it, and because of the the, the 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 success of the operation, and that was one I was involved in. Um, Gavin Jones is the next one. Apologies if this has been asked. Um, I had seen several amazing stories you have previously posted on Facebook. Were you able to put them in a book? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if you were listening earlier, but um, my book is um, The Joy of Flying um, by Steve Murray, and that's available on Amazon. And I'm always impressed with Amazon because you order it, and obviously they print it immediately and send it because you get it within a couple of weeks maximum. Um, and that is it was, um, it might not be the, your normal um, book on flying by a pilot, or, or certainly a combat pilot, or a fighter pilot, or a helicopter pilot. Um, because I've been an engineer, and I assume a lot of the, the support I got from the Facebook uh, pages, which basically had the book published for me, is that um, a lot of these guys were technicians and, and ground crew who, who, who followed the book because and I think it's because I was, I was I probably put, it in the, put them in the cockpit. They went, they'd never been exposed to flying, been able to go flying. Certainly, some air forces they can't get it. There's no back seat or anything like that. That they didn't get to fly. So I think I was able to, um, having a background in engineering, I was able to put them in the cockpit as well, and that seemed to have made it reasonably popular. Um, so it's it's the books. Um, it's in my interview. They might kindly advertise for me. Um, and we back, we got Will Decker again. How familiar now or at the time were you with both him and John Emmett's music here? Yeah. yeah, not anymore, but at the time it was very popular with DJ, very um, patriotic type of um, music. And I'm not mistaken, he was, was it him? He was um, the stepson of um, Ian Smith, the Prime Minister. Next one, Mike Smith. Do you recall how long it took for the ground crew to complete an engine change on the Hunter? Good question. Um, it it was probably longer than a, a, long, a lot of aircraft these days where they can just drop the engine out of the engine bay. Um, on the Hunter, they had to uh, undo all the bolts that held the aircraft together midway in the, the rear fuselage, and then pull the whole rear fuselage away, and then they can get at the Hunter. But I wouldn't say it would take um, a, a good crew more than a, than a day to, to, to do a complete engine change. Um, I had a, we had one problem, one problem with an engine 
Um, in fact, my father-in-law was was the was the the warrant officer in charge of the squadron engineering. It was coming from Angola. As I mentioned in my previous interview, we were quite lucky. We used to go and do before this is before the war started. We used to go do externals to South Africa, to Angola, Mozambique, and we'd go and have night stops uh, or even lunch stops. And um, in this particular case, two aircraft were coming back from Angola and wanted to develop an engine problem. Um, in the eastern side of Angola, and they were able to land there, and they flew out um, a deck, a DC-3 with an engine in there, and I'm pretty sure that was done in a day, even though they spent a night, an overnight there. So that's about the time um, span, I would say, within a day, I would say. Um, air crew interview, thank you. Was that right? The David Smith you talked about? Oh. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay, David Smith's the next one. You talked about the Israelis coming down to work with the SAP. Were, what were some of the most important lessons to come out of that? Good question. I think I did, I did speak about this um, in that earlier interview. Um, the first thing was, it unfortunately, probably meant that, the, that we, one of the reasons we didn't get the Mirage 3C um, in Rhodesia, which I, I'm pretty sure was. The original idea was that we would go down when the South Africans got the Mirage F1. Um, they figured the 3C was a bit redundant, and, uh, and uh, the, between the, the, at that stage, South Africa, the Portuguese, and Mozambique, and the Rhodesians were all working together on anti-terrorist um, at, at that stage. And anyway, and so the South Africans probably realised that we could be of some help. Um, from incursions from the north that we had more aircraft. And the 3C was going to be the one that would go there. We would replace, the, um, well, we would take it and the F1 would replace the 3C. And as it turned out, I just understand that we were actually in reduced uniforms on the squadron in South Africa. And the Israelis happened to ask the South Africans, as I understand it, what are these reduced in here? And they, they said, oh, well, they will be taking the 3C back. And the, so the Israelis said, yeah, you're crazy. That is your best dogfighter. And it was. Out of the two, the two um, Mirage 3s, it was the best dogfighter. And um, I actually thought at one stage that they would make, uh, sort of convert them to cheaters as well. But the 3C, never, that never occurred. But that was one of the reasons that we didn't um, take them back. And, the, and then now we're coming back to the flying side itself. And I think I might have mentioned that as well. Um, we, we, we did our air to air dogfighting. Um, a lot of it is based around the one to one, one versus one was on the egg, which is where you 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 climb up in a, in a fight, you go to the vertical so that you reduce your radius of turn at the top. And um, the Israelis said they weren't too happy with that. What they would do is they would actually, they would, with power in, in, at the merge, they would climb um, with power on and obviously turning. And um, but they would come back to its best, the, the, whatever aircraft they're flying to its best turning performance, and they would manage that. They would maintain that that energy at that rate. So even though the aircraft, other aircraft might be climbing up above them into the to, to reduce the radius, when it actually came down again, the aircraft with the best turning performance, which would be Israeli, could turn inside the aircraft. And that we so we started doing that instead of doing this great big vertical climb. Is actually climb until the, the performance of the rear at our best turning performance and then hold that at whatever level that was. The other thing we did we learn from them was um, much the same as we would probably have in, in an air combat situation, um, if we were not so much air combat, in, in a strike formation, if we were going to target, we used to go, I remember going out with um, four mirages carrying all the bombs and everything and then being escorted by another four mirages. So you'd have this, um, the four down below and then above them would be the escort. And when it came to, when we were then attacked, and you start start turning eight aircraft in, in, a, in a sort of in a maneuver to get away from the, whoever was attacking us, it became an aircraft all over the sky. What the Israelis did, they went up in pairs. So they would just put um, a pair of aircraft in combat pairs three kilometers apart, and then another pair behind that, probably a couple of miles behind that, also in pair combat, and then they would go back, say, if you were, as we had um, eight aircraft, you'd be quite extended 
um, line in, in, in Bears patrol all the way back. And if someone attacked from behind, at that stage, it would attack from behind because they were, our missiles were all um, rear sector missiles. Um, the, the, rear, the rear pair would break off and go and fight, whereas the rest continued on to the strike. And that was something we then employed um, with a smaller air force. Um, and, and the South Africans went, as I mentioned earlier, they went and flew with them, and the South Africans did all right. So that was, that was good. I hope that answered your question. Um, thank you for replying and replying. We're down to MKMD Exploration and Paranormal. Hi, Steve. When you're flying the Hunter uh, and flying when it reaches the D note, the blue note, we call it. I know I never heard the blue note, but blue note. It's infamous noise, mate. Can you feel it in the aircraft as we heard on the ground? No, you can't at all. Um, and it's interesting. There's some speculation of what makes that noise, and it is a very distinctive noise. Um, that ooh, it would sound something like that. But um, the, they figured they worked it out that it was the four Aiden Cannon gun ports, and it, they just worked like at a certain speed, whatever the speed was. They just acted as if they were organ pipes, and um, similar to that's what that noise it simulated. And it was always great to go to an air show when the hunter did his beat-ups, and you could hear that sound. And um, I hope that answered that question. Um, Biggles Tintin, did you ever fly the stimmer against UK or US airframes? No, and all the time that I was flying, um, both in the hunter and the mirage, we were sort of uh, pariahs in the, in the international sphere, so we didn't get to fly with anyone else. Um, sometimes the, the hunters were, and the, the mirages would mix. As I said, in the hunters, we used to fly down to South Africa, and they might be bounced by mirages, but in that sort of dissimilar, the mirage kept very much out of the picture because the hunter could turn so well. In fact, um, I, had a friend, uh, I trained a chap in Qantas here, and he flew mirages in, in Australia. And he said he once he was flying against a hunter in Singapore, and he decided to mix it. Well, it didn't work out too well for him uh, because the hunter turned so well in the mirage. If you bring the speed down, it doesn't turn well at all. And uh, I actually put that in one of my children's books to show <laughs> that, an hunt, that an aircraft with a good pilot can sometimes bring down a superior aircraft. Um, the next question is uh, Christy. Glad to hear that. My uncle flew the MiG-21 in the early 2000s. It was upgraded in 1995 in Israel. Sadly, I've seen that the last five years it crashed quite a lot. Yeah, I don't know where we, we, we've, we've um, right, um, sort of sent this message from, Chris. It might be, um, it might be in India, perhaps, upgrade 1905, because they've had Indians, Indians have lost quite a few um, MiG 21s. But once again, a capable aircraft. Um, I, I was interested to listen to, to read John. I, I recommend this book for those who like. Um, fight aircraft, a book by John Boyd, and I think the book's just called Boyd. And uh, Boyd was a brilliant pilot and brilliant engineer, and obviously a brilliant guy. And he, in the Korean War, he actually um, worked out the mathematical um, dogfight, the maneuvers in dogfights. Up until that time, it was just sort of second seat. But anyway, he actually was involved in the design of the F-16 and F-15. And he was really disappointed because with all those contractors and armament contractors in, the, in America, that, those aircraft were designed as, as dogfighters. And, um, and what they eventually do is just put a whole lot of bombs and missiles all over them. You know? And he was really disappointed by that because he said the Americans build, they design a beautiful fighter and then they put all this extra stuff, all this weaponry on it to sell to the contractors. Whereas the Russians, if they build a dogfighter, it remains a dogfighter. And I think the MiG-21 is probably a good example of that. And um, unfortunately, most of the, I guess the people who in, in combat who flew the MiG-21 were up, up against more capable, not so much aircraft, but pilots. If that can be um, probably correct in my assumption. But once again, yeah, it was... Uh, as most Russian aircraft, very capable aircraft and very easy to maintain. Short on engine time and probably fuel, but still. And unfortunately, 
in the last few years, I've been, I've quite, I haven't read really too much about it, but in the last five years, quite a few have crashed. It might just be to do with age. And um, Craig Learmonth, Learmonth um, did you ever have any superstitions or any sort of routine that you like to do before flying? No, <laughs> no Craig. Um, I'm not like those cricketers and tennis players who have all those superstitions and you see them go through it all day. I must admit, I I never did, and I don't know anyone that I know personally who did either. Yeah, perhaps you know someone, you might have heard of it. Pans Zeta Jr., how fit do you have to be uh, for the Air Force? Uh, good question. And I think if you watch a lot of YouTube, I've seen some, some, some quite a few recently as well, especially these days, if you're pulling up to 9G, You've got to be fit. And not and I don't always have to be slim and looking like a, a six pack or anything like that. It's a lot of it's a capability and just conditioning to pull those sort of G. But um but it, it's it's a, it's hard work. I, the, the hunter was geared to seven G and we very seldom got up there, even in a dog fight, you might go up to five, but it's a sustained five G uh, for, for a while. And you get out of it sweating. Uh, it's hard work. So these guys now are pulling uh, up to nine Gs, it's a, it's a hard work. So it certainly be fit. I know I went um, when I went to the pilot course. I'd seen how the pilots had to go through uh, having been an engineer. So I made sure when I went on the pilot course, I was really fit uh, because for the first six weeks you're running. You don't let, they don't let you walk anywhere, and you're running. So for, even from that point of view, just to be able to get through that pilot course, you need to be fit. And of course, as I mentioned, when you start putting those sort of Gs. You need to be fit. Um, David Smith, did you ever fly low to sight to see buzz around training? <laughs> um, it wasn't, you know, this was basically beating up trains and truckers and farmers. Um, yes. <laughs> but we, you know, obviously it wasn't, it wasn't encouraged, but um, I generally did it to people I knew, um, and I mentioned the one story, and I'll mention it again. Um, the, what got my book going was um, during COVID. I sat down, it was my father's birthday. He passed away 30 years before, but it was his birthday, and I decided uh, to tell the story where um, he was. He used to travel around the farms in Rhodesia, and he asked me if any chance I could come and visit him once in my hunter. So I said, we found out where he was on a farm, and I did my task with a very fancy camera, F95 camera, a reconnaissance camera, on the pod on the side. And uh, I found the farm, and they could hear me coming. There were a lot of farmers there. They were having some, they were doing cattle dipping and that sort of stuff. A lot of cattle, a lot of workers. And I came down, I got down to about 500 knots, and just about, probably 100 feet. And I went over the top of it. And um, so that, when you look at the photograph that, that, I, that I took, everyone's just standing there, the cattle, the head are down. My dad is actually waving because he can see me. Of course, there's no noise at that stage. You can just see this aircraft coming at them at about 100 feet. So he's waving at me. You can re almost recognize him. You've got the farmer standing around. Well, of course, when I went over, there was this, wow. Anyway, I phoned him that night. I said, Dad, how did you enjoy that? He said, um, there was a bit of silence. He said, please don't do that again. He said, they spent the rest of the day um, looking for cattle, putting up cattle fed. They've knocked all the fences down. They had built new fences around the dips and everything. So I wasn't very, really, well, he wasn't very really popular with the, with the farmers around him. And another time as well in South Africa, I did the same sort of thing with people who wanted to see me. And of course, they, I went out and visited them. They loved it. It was, people always love a beat up, I think. So that, yeah, but I didn't do it on any um, unsuspecting people. I think <laughs> a bit dangerous. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes unwelcome. Uh, the next one's Biggles Tinton. I think it's fantastic you had an engineering background before you became a pilot. Do you think it'd be a good idea for all pilots to spend a year in the ground training and uh, learning in engineering? Um, Biggles Tinton, actually, no. Um, when I went into it, I had to because I didn't have the qualifications. Uh, and when I, uh, having done it, I was really pleased because. Um, it was nice to work in the aircraft, but also the quality of the guys I was working with. They've been very down to earth and everything. And I, re I, I enjoyed my time. I didn't really enjoy the, the work. I, 
Um, I wasn't. I was an instrument fitter, so I never spent any time in the instrument section where you had to work in instruments. I just liked working in the squadron, and I was, I was only ever worked in the hunter. Um, the other thing that did help me when I became fly is I spent a year working in the hunter simulator, and, I, and there was a horrible thing to fly, and the pilots hated it. But um, I would sit in as often as I wanted. And I think that really helped me. I actually came top in my course on the flying side, uh, weapons and flying, on the Provost and the Vampire, and I think. <laughs> That had a lot to me to do, lot to do with me flying um, the simulator. Um, but but to answer your question, no, I don't think so. I think it my it it, it 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 actually slows down your progress. I actually um, I think I went on to the hunter when I was when I was uh, twenty four, and I could have been there when I was twenty. It just slows everything down. I think now I think straight into flying is probably the best way to go. Um, because of engineering background, do you find that you had more sim uh, sympathetic to the airframe air than, your, than your colleagues? Not necessarily. I don't think so. I had more sympathy to the ground crew, perhaps, than, I, than, than my colleagues. And I think um, not so much in our Air Force, but I hear, understand other Air Forces where you've got this gradient between the, the, the officer corps and the pilots and the ground crew. And I think some of the, sometimes the treatment one way uh, – down is not as good as it should be. So I think I had that from that aspect, I think I'd, I'd more simply what, the, what what they had to do and the work they had to do rather than the airframe itself. I think pilots generally, uh, professional pilots, are generally very uh, sympathetic to the, the plane they're flying because it's not normally you that damages the aircraft or it has an accident. It's the guys that come afterwards. Okay, Christy said he's a Romanian Air Force. Okay, so I didn't know that. that well, I know they've got F-16s now, so <laughs> perhaps they, they were keen to go off the MiG-21 to the, uh, the F-16. And the Romanian Air Force, the Romanians would have upgraded the MiG-21 as well, so that's interesting. Um, Chelsea Dagger, hi. My question is, could you feel the power difference or take between the Hunter and the Mirage? Yes, um, Chelsea, um, very much so. Um, actually, it's interesting, and I think I mentioned in the early interview I did, is that... Um, when I came to fly the Mirage, because the Hunter had a uh, coming off the Vampire, which had no acceleration at all and didn't have a, 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 a an FCU a fuel control unit, so you couldn't stay on the throttle like on takeoff like you could on the on the later aircraft with FCUs, and you sort of staggered into the air. Whereas the when I got on the Mirage into uh, the Hunter, and we didn't have a two seater at that stage, so I was only a two hundred hours total flying, um, and the power was just amazing, the acceleration. In fact, I spoke to Hunter, um, um, wasn't he? it was a Harrier pilot recently, and he said, no, the Hunter far outperformed the Harrier on a straight, you know, a, a conventional takeoff. Um, then I went to the, the Mirage, now expecting to have this power. So when I went to full dry thrust, release the brakes is what you do, and then once you're moving, then go into afterburner. But that, how the, dry, the military thrust or dry thrust um, on the Mirage wasn't as impressive as the Hunter. Of course, then you go into the afterburner and then it leapt away. And the CZ, once again, was acceleration was actually better than the easy, the later aircraft. My, that's my, I think I mentioned to Michael in my in previous interview, when you sort of an aircraft, a basic aircraft like the Mirage 3C, and then they develop like a Mirage E, they put fuel here and they extend it there. They might put a bigger engine, but it just didn't, quite often doesn't have the performance of the earlier model. And I think that might be the same as uh, with Chrissy, if you're still listening. The, the, the Romanian Air Force, the, the MiG 21, I think as that advanced, I think its performance probably reduced as far as air combat went. But anyway, that I don't know that uh, I can't qualify that. Um, David Boardman, did the Mirage 3 have a look down, shoot down radar? <laughs> no, I flew the Mirage 3C and even the EZ. We had the Serrano 1 in the C and I think the Serrano 2 in the E. And that could barely pick up a target. Well, it could pick up a target about 12 miles. You could lock it on at 8 miles and that was about it. But that's a straight, straight level. I mean, you couldn't do anything up or down at that stage. We're talking about aircraft that's what, 50 years old now. Oh, no, that's good, probably... Just a little bit younger, 65 years old. So it had the, the very early radars and um, and the very basic missile. We had the Atom, uh, what is it? The uh, what's the the fire with the sidewinder? Um, AM. We had AM9B. I think it was announced an AM9Z. 
or something. So anyway, you have a very basic, but a uh, very basic radar. Um, Beagle Twin, thank you for your uh, uh, have I lost it? Uh, thank you for your answer. I'm very envious of your career. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Beagles. I honestly, uh, I think I mentioned at one of my interviews um, that if I could have written, if I'd been given a chance to write my script of what I'd like to have done in my career, I couldn't have done better than what I actually got. I was very, very fortunate. And uh, I also mentioned just what I'm there is what I've done a few of these interviews now. And one of the, the reasons I'm very happy to do them is to talk to you guys, people who, because when I was, before I started flying, I was like my young um, nephew here, Jordan, He's 14 years old. He's just desperate to fly. And that's I was the same. So to be able to speak to your pilot about it, I'm more than happy to chat. And it's also a record of what we did out there because things have changed in Africa, as you know. Yin um, can you describe landing in the Mirage 3, a fast landing, high-speed descent of all deltas? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, Jim. Um, and we... We had a thing called an, an Adamar. It was obviously a French thing, but it's the angle of attack indicator on, on the Mirage. And because of that delta, you couldn't let your speed get down. So if you were sort of reducing your speed, the first thing, the light, a green light would come on, and then it would, it would go green amber, and then now you know your angle of attack's increasing. It would go amber red, and now it's getting a bit serious, and then it would go red. At red, you, need to have, to, you have to do something because... If you did, if you did depart or, or stall in the mirage, um, it would come out of it. It would take too long, certainly in the circuit. But coming around, um, say on downwind um, on the mirage, you, as you sort of start at the top of downwind, you just go to green, and then coming around the corner, you watch the speed very carefully, and you want to maintain your power to keep it around about amber, amber red around the corner, and the angle of attack is increasing, and then rolling out and final. Now. The angle, of, the, angle of, your, the angle of attack coming in around you was 8 degrees, and you flared to 14 degrees as you touched. So you couldn't see much in front of you at that stage. And you're going along, we're landing with 100 and, 150 knots or whatever it was, you know. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. It, the mirrors itself was a, was a handful. I, I went there very junior. I think I did, probably only had 600 hours. And um, I remember training a chap in Qantas once, and he said, he was posted to the Mirage here in, in Australia. And after two flights, he said, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this. It's, it's too fast. It's too much of a handful. And it was. But, I mean, they taught us well, and it, it would be fine. But, um, yeah, the, the biggest problem with the landing, I think, would be if the, the drag chute didn't work. Because of the high speed, the brakes in those days probably weren't as good as they are now or not as efficient as they are now. And so if you lost the parachute, you realize your parachute wasn't going to open You'd have to go around and really come in and bring the numbers right back and then, you know, and be very careful. But we, we flew with 3,000 meter runways, 3,500 meter runways. It wasn't a problem. Yeah, but very different from the, the, the Hunter, for example. Christy, uh, it, uh, again, uh, it, flies, uh, it flies with a lot of restrictions. Today, our Ministry of Defense announced May 15 this year the fleet's going to be retired. Yeah. I, I think, Christy, um, it's a pity in a way, isn't it? Um, the aircraft these days, I think, I suppose, um, the aircraft these days just look after you. Um, th those days, perhaps we have to work a little bit harder um, to fly them, um, and, and, but the rewards might have been better. They were, they were basic aircraft. For, for me, for example, if I fly my VR at the moment, I just like dogfighting. I don't... The missile, you can you pick, you don't have to do any maneuvering at all. You pick a bloke up as far as you want, you just fire off the missile. And quite often, a lot of the flying is done in autopilot. And I think I mentioned to, to Mike, you know, the, the beauty of flying a Mirage um, 3 and a, and a MiG-21 would be the same capabilities. It's a Tiger Moth and steroids. I mean, you, you've got, you do all the same maneuvers in, in a gun situation, but you have to be careful what you're doing. And you've got, but you've got a lot of power. It, it was amazing fun. So in a lot of ways, and also I think I mentioned this in Mike's interview as well. Uh, the the uh, Gio Gura, he's an Israeli. He shot down 19 aircraft, jet pilot, uh, he, in, in the Mirage, the Nisha, which was the Israeli version, and also the F-16. 
And afterwards, the, the chap asked him and said um, uh, in an interview, which aircraft would you prefer to fly? And he was silent for a short while, and he said the Mirage. He said the Mirage, I've got total control. He said through, uh, through the power steering, uh, through the power controls, but he said um, F-16, you're just one of the inputs. And I, so at the end of the day, I'm, I'm sadly here about the Mirage, about the mix, you know. Um, it's obviously a more capable aircraft now because you've got the F-16 in Romania, but still, it's still there sadly here. I just hope they preserve some um, in museums and that type of thing. They need to be preserved. That's a big thing, I think, is we need to preserve the aircraft because these aircraft win wars, and people say, oh, it's a pilot. I say, yes, but you need an airplane to be flying as well. So we need to preserve our aircraft when they stop flying. I'm trying to so do the same. I'm, I've got a Hawker Hunter here, which is in a museum. And um, the, I'm trying to, now I'm trying to get a Mirage for this museum as well. So, Steve, uh, do you want to answer a couple more questions while we wrap up this brilliant Q&A? Yeah, I'm happy to go as long as you want. Mike, you just sh shut me up when you think I've had enough. A couple more <laughs> questions, it will be absolutely perfect. Okay, I've got David. Um, it's, it's from David. It's, uh, it's, this has been such a great Q&A. Thanks for all your answers. Was the most uh, most of your flying done in daytime? No, most of it's done in daytime. Very, very little I flying. The Mirage and the Hunter were day fighters. So that was it. With Zin Yang Yang, any DACT missions flying in Mirage 3 or Hunter during the BFMs? No, unfortunately... The only discipline we ever did was between the Hunter and the Mirage, or between the Mirage and Mirage, between the CZ and the EZ, which I mentioned earlier. And there's another one. Well, thanks for the interview. How do you see the future of the UAVs in the manufacturing field? Yeah, I must admit, I've actually always been an advocate that we wouldn't get to, um, uh, like we got, what do we know, with a Generation 5 aircraft, you know, in the, in the F-35, the F-22, and the, whatever the Russian one is. And I just thought next it would be a UAV because the amount of uh, having, a, having a pilot there, but now they go to the next generation, which is good for pilots. You can still be flying. So I think it looks like it's going to keep on going, which is good. Well, and brilliant stuff. Always, right? Yeah, that was an absolutely brilliant Q&A. And I want to thank Steve and his wingman for coming on this show <laughs> because they had to get up at 3 a.m. their time. So... An absolute pleasure to have you on, Steve. But uh, also, thank you very much to the people who came in the comments and put some great questions in. But uh, yeah, Steve, just uh, one reminder, where can we find your book online? Is it just Amazon? Have you got a website? Yeah, it's it's Amazon. Um, the, the, uh, we'll have a website. I've got a website, but it's it's about my children's book, Hunting the Jet Fighter. But the book's very easy to, to acquire. As I said, I said to you once, I had to buy some of my own ones. It's just on Amazon. And it's um, Joy of Flying, Steve Murray. That's it. And it'll come out. It comes out to hardback, softback, and Kindle. And it comes. It arrives very quickly as well, which is really good. Absolutely. Yeah. After that, one question for myself: Have you got any books uh, in the future planned? Yes, I've got three being published at the moment, mate. Oh, very nice. I, Can you explain a bit more. There might have been a for for your your um, uh, viewers. But um, I was encouraged after I wrote my children's book for four to eight year olds about that was Hunty the Jet Fighter, about my hunter and stories about its, its adventures. Um, someone encouraged me, um, owner of a bookshop who, took, who liked my books, said I should be writing for eight to 12 year olds because Biggles is no longer. And so I've written about um, uh, the boy jet fighter pilot. And this nice. is about a, a young boy who flies with his granddad um, in, a, in sort of in, a, in, a, in, a, in two dimensions, but he's got older cousins who get to fly the Hunter, which is in dolphin colors, and the and the Mirage in tiger colors. And they have adventures, dog fighting with L39, L29, MiG-21, and now it's going, the next one, the fourth book's coming out soon, that will be an F-16 flying against uh, MiG-29. Wow, that's going to be great. So, as soon as I've got that up, I'll send you a link for my um website mike and perhaps you can put it on that way yeah absolutely we'll link it all when that comes out for you steve on our social media but uh yeah steve and your wingman thank you very much for coming on we really <laughs> do appreciate it and yeah thank you to everyone who joined us tonight it was an absolute brilliant q a some great questions and i learned a lot as well so steve uh thank you very much for coming on your pleasure thank you for the questions as well mike and thank you for your support and for the support in aviation it's great to for people who don't fly, 
to be able to listen to pilots. I enjoy it, you know, and listening to pilots and aircraft. I'd love to fly. And it's always a great interview. So well done, Mike. Cheers. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.